Hey friends, today for our 12 noon Facebook Live connection, I just wanted to talk about some things that um, I think when we look at sheltering in place and we look at this COVID-19 um, time that we're in, my, my concern is that there are things that are happening right now in a temporary condition, but will actually have an effect in the future much later on. So in thinking about that, um, I was listening to uh, Jay Kim and he was, he was talking um, to Isaac Serrano on the Regeneration podcast. And one of the things that they were talking about was the way that um, slot machines and smartphones have something in common. Uh, it's just one of the aspects of their talk, but I don't know if you've ever been a slot machine person, but I know that some people really love to go to Vegas. They love to play at the slots. And what is it about that slot machine that causes people to have an addictive nature towards it? You know, I think um, if someone were to say, hey, we're going to give some money to some people and and that money is going to go to the, the third caller or the third person that logs onto this website or, you know, the 58th person. You'd get some people that do that. But in Vegas and in these casinos, you have people that will literally drive, stay in a hotel so that they could sit in front of this machine and throw coins in and keep pulling that handle and watching the things spin until they all line up. Now, what does that have to do with us in the situation that we're in with sheltering in place and smartphones? The developers of smartphones and uh, the technology of the touch screen really had this idea that they actually took from slot machines. There is some endorphin that happens, some drip in our brain, some of that pleasure center of being fulfilled when we actually do something physical and that physical action causes something visual for us to see, and then there's a stimulus, and, there, and then there's a response. So every time I, I touch something, it's kind of like on a phone, if you notice that when you pull down on the screen, it takes a while for the screen to refresh. While it refreshes, there's usually some type of a wheel or something that spins, and then all of a sudden, the new content is there. And developers of smartphones realized that instead of refreshing the screen automatically, like a website would do on a desktop, there's something tangible about our phones that if we touch them and we actually have to do the action of pulling down and then we see it spin and then the new content comes up, one of the things that they find is that it causes this pleasure stimulus in our brains, which is addictive in its nature. So when I consider that, 2007 was just a, a, key, a, a key year when it comes to technology and it comes to the way that we function. Because I remember in 2007, I was pastoring a church in Gilroy, and there was a couple from our church that um, had spent hours in line at the mall in San Jose at the Westfield Mall, um, you know, it used to be called Oak Ridge, I think it was. And so they were at the mall waiting in line at the Apple store because it was the release of the iPhone. And I remember, you know, I'm not a futurist. So during that time, I was thinking, well, I have a cell phone and I have a computer. Why would I need a smartphone? In fact, I don't want a computer in my pocket. I just want to be able to make phone calls and just... Um, not have to worry about checking that thing, and it's so small, and I'd have to use my thumbs in order to type, and I would, I, who would want to do that, right? And then when I found out how much the price point was for these iPhones, I was thinking, wow, that is really crazy. Who would want to spend that much money for a smartphone? Now, over time, uh, we see the advent of the smartphone in 2007 have, has really changed our behavior. More than likely, some of you are watching on a smartphone. In fact, I'm recording this on, on a, my iPhone. So we realize that technology can be very useful, especially during times like this shutdown uh, um, of you know shelter in place and, and being separated from one another. So church has gone online. It's gone virtual. 
Let me give you two other things that happened right around 2007 that kind of changed the trajectory of our culture and our landscape. Not only was the smartphone, the iPhone, invented, but Facebook and Twitter really started to go viral and become public companies that were not only traded, but also used nationally and even internationally. So not only do we have the smartphone device, but then we have these different apps and these programs that we're using, and that's causing us to look at our screen, to look for the likes and to look for the follows, and then Instagram comes along and then Snapchat comes along. Now, with all of these things that draw us to our devices and draw our attention to screens, I'm not saying that all technology is bad. In fact, I'm very thankful, like I said, that during a time like this, that we are able to um, connect with people virtually like we are right now. In, in fact, um, as I'm uh, just sharing this with you, if there are some specific things that are happening, uh, problems, difficulties, struggles during this COVID-19 shutdown for you, um, if you would just type those in and maybe we could address some of those. But let me share with you some of the ways that I think that it's affecting us right now. But I also am um, fearful in some ways that this is going to have an effect way beyond the shelter in place time that we're in. The first one is relationships. It's often that you go to restaurants now and you could see people that are sitting together in a booth a, a, a part, you know, across from one another and they're looking at their smartphones. Or you could see a whole group of people together and they're all looking at their smartphones. In order to have conversation and in order to have real life connection, and I'm not saying that you can't have connection, on a video screen, but there is an awkward part of that small talk of getting to know people and listening to them. I, I, it's funny, uh, there's some friends of mine that joke about um, one of the great things that's gonna happen because of this COVID-19 shelter in place is that when we go back to church and meeting physically in a space that we're getting rid of the turn around and greet someone time. You know, extroverts love that, introverts hate it. And I get it. And we've struggled back and forth, but I just feel like, hey, it's a good way just to get to know someone or at least their name. Because when it comes to relationship, it takes time to move from small talk to in-depth talk. You don't go up to a stranger or even an acquaintance that you see in church once in a while and say, hey, you know what? The thing I'm really struggling with is this addiction or uh, I'm really struggling with loneliness right now. You, you don't go, you don't lead into conversations like that. They take time. And because we don't have as much face-to-face -face time, there was already an effect on Gen Z, the youngest generation, that face-to-face -face interaction is so awkward and so difficult for them. When I was growing up, my mom would make me talk to adults she would tell me, you go up to them, you shake their hand, you look at them in the eye, you ask them questions, you listen to them. And, and that's a, a forgotten skill when it comes to conversation and generations. But now that we are used to this, our brains are already being formed in a way that is the easiest. We have a tendency, just as human beings, to flow in the direction that is the least resistance. So again, when it comes to relationships, how is this going to affect interpersonal relationships after this is over? In small groups, when it comes around to an opportunity to share or to, um, to ask for prayer, um, we, we have to be careful that this limited time doesn't affect us for the long term. And I know it will, but we have to fight against that. Now, there are some things that are good that are happening as well. In some ways, I've heard that in some life groups um, on Zoom or, you know, just on a screen, that some people that usually don't share are starting to share. So maybe there's some positive things as well. Let me tell you another area of concern for me is my brain. It's concentration. I feel like with every passing year, I become more ADD and more ADHD, which is really hard when it takes 
15 to 20 hours to study for a message sometimes, but that takes longer if I can't focus and I can't stay on one topic long enough. Concentration, uh, we know, takes effort. Last night I was talking to my girls. We were, we were talking about how at the dinner table, sometimes they'll talk about the things that they're going through and they, they have this meme talk. They'll talk about like little uh, TikTok videos or YouTube videos or things that are just like funny little videos that they, they see and then they'll talk to each other. The way that maybe you have carried on with a dialogue from one of your favorite movies and, and there's some other geek that knows that same movie and then that you just start repeating lines and no one else knows. Like for me, that was Nacho Libre. I could, I could say lines from there and only Nacho Libre fans would understand what I'm talking about. Well, when it comes to concentration, we have to be able to listen to other people, to be able to read, to be able to filter through information that is tedious and difficult and hard concepts long enough for our brains to be able to comprehend things. And we're used to really quick hits right now. In fact, uh, a video that's over five minutes is gonna be hard for a lot of us to even sit through. Um, another area of concern is prayer. Re remember that prayer is not really just talking to God. In fact, this Sunday, I'm going to start a, a series in the Psalms. Um, got that idea from uh, Ben from our church. Hey, hey, this would be a great time to go through Psalms. I started thinking about it, praying about it. And, and Psalms are an answer to prayer because in that prayer book, um, God gave almost like a hymnal for people to be able to pray. But prayer is not just saying things, it's also listening. There's the aspect of being still and hearing what God is saying. And if you have a smartphone and you put it away from you during your time of prayer, there's this addictive nature that wants, your, your head starts looking towards it, your hand starts looking for it, or if you leave the house without it, you start feeling like a little bit panicky. See, there's this connection that before cell phones, we would leave the house and we would be fine, right? Just driving away, walking out of the house. And it's something that we struggle with. So I think when it comes to prayer and listening to the Lord, the still small voice of the Lord sometimes gets drowned out amongst the notifications on a phone. It's one of the reasons why I would suggest if you use your phone for studying the Bible or reading through a Bible app that you put it in airplane mode, but also that you have a physical Bible that you're using so that you could read it. And then one last area that I want to hit in in this last minute or two, <clears throat> it's gathering as a body of Christ. Um, are we still going to gather the same way that we used to gather? At the beginning of we won't. I don't think it's going to be a light switch where all of a sudden things go back to the way that they were. In fact, there will be some things that never really go back to the exact way that they were. But I think in the gradual time of gathering together, there's going to be smaller groups. We're looking at how to do that. Would it be smaller groups that gather in the church kind of with physical spacing would it be multiple services on a Sunday morning? Um, I'm excited that the possibility could happen that when we're able to gather together, we could meet behind the church. We have this beautiful Redwood Grove. We have an amphitheater and seats that are there and everyone's kind of spread out. That would be just a, a great celebration to be able to have like a um, some type of a barbecue back there and uh, music. And, and for some people that it may not be safe for them to gather yet, they could drive up maybe in their car and they could just pull up there. So in all of these things, the way that technology has affected us, uh, the way that I'm struggling, my kids are struggling, my wife is struggling, I, I think we're all struggling with these things. It's okay um, to, to know that. It, it's okay that during this time, it's important for us to realize we're not alone. You're not the only one struggling. Um, yesterday, one of my daughters was just saying, I just feel so bored. You know, I, there's only so much that I could do with playing a game or a smartphone or, or reading a book or she's even doing these exercise routines and she just wants to go out and be with friends. So we're looking for the, the time when that happens. And my hope and my prayer 
is that when Paul wrote to the Hebrews, well, I don't know if it was Paul, I think it was Paul, but whoever it was that wrote um, to the Hebrews in the book of Hebrews, not to forsake the gathering together of the brethren. We're to stir one another up. And that was at a time when the writing was because there was persecution. The church was afraid to meet because they never knew if the Roman guards would come in and break up their meeting and drag them away. And Paul was challenging them. Don't forsake the gathering together of the brethren. And I want to challenge you that as things are safer and things are lifted and restrictions are, are, are lifted, that we don't take this temporary time and, and say, well, you know what, this is so convenient. And we stop gathering in the collective physical body together as the body of Christ. After all, when it comes to the greatest needs, if if someone is hurting, it's one thing to give them a phone call. And right now, maybe that's something that we have to do in some cases. But you know that if you had a friend that was struggling, that the greatest thing you could do is be with them, is just sit in their presence. Sometimes it's not the words that we say, but it's the presence that we give. So just want to encourage you, if you um, have other topics, other things that maybe during this COVID-19 uh, shelter in place time that you're struggling with, if you could put those in the comments even after this video, we could address those in the future, but I'm going to pray us out. So Father, thank you for this time, and I pray that as we gather together, maybe Lord at distance right now, but then in the future collectively, um, that you would maintain uh, that fellowship, the bond that we have. I pray, Lord, that there would be some temporary things that are good, some surprises that come out of this sheltering in place, some families that get closer, and some re realization of really what's important. But I do pray that you would guard us from the unintended consequences of this time. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you guys. Have my Frontier Ranch hat on today to shout out to Mission Springs. Uh, we're praying for you guys. We're praying for Mount Hermon, you know, the local Christian camps, hoping that you'll be able to meet. This year would have been a great year. Uh, will be, hopefully, for my daughters. Uh, one of my daughters will be her last year in camp. The other one may be a counselor there. So um, anyhow, shout out to Mission Springs and Frontier Ranch. And uh, see you next time. Uh, tomorrow is Worship Wednesday. Okay, God bless you guys.